capital city of Peru, is the administrative center of a republic rich in historical background. Established by Pizarro more than four centuries ago, Lima was for years the dominant city of all South America. Today, it is the nerve center of Peruvian politics, commerce, finance, and education. Its citizens, largely of Spanish lineage, have much in common with all modern city dwellers. In Lima are found the banks of international trade. Here, too, are the offices of modern business enterprise, typified by the headquarters of the telephone concern. Representative of another function of Lima in Peru's national life is the University of San Marcos, founded in 1551. A proud and impressive capital is Lima, with its stately homes and imposing public plazas, rich in historic lore. But in the remote high Andes of Peru, there are remnants of another earlier glory, where silent, crumbled ruins are witness to a vanished age. In these mountains once dwelt the Incas, proud rulers of a vast Indian empire. Strong and immense were the fortresses they built to guard the paths of empire from the foe. The stones of fortresses and of imperial dwellings, these have remained but the civilization which flourished here vanished long ago. Long before the ships of the white man touched on South American shores, the life of a far-flung empire centered here. Advanced in the arts of war and peace, the Incas administered from mountain strongholds the affairs of highly organized society. Only ruins remain. Ruins and descendants of a once proud Indian people. In Cusco, the Inca capital, a monastery now stands upon masonry once the Inca Temple of the Sun. Where his forebears passed in proud procession, the present-day Indian makes his indifferent way. Yet Cusco is still an Indian city. The empire passed, the people have remained. Threading narrow streets, bordered by masonry reminiscent of past glory, they still adhere to ways tradition has preserved. Life goes on. The marketplace brings together those who buy and those who sell. Ever prominent are corn and potato, which spread from Peru around the world. There are blankets woven on native looms. There are sandals made from discarded motor tires. But far from populous Cusco, out in the broad reaches of the plateau are the commonal Indian villages of even more traditional pattern. In one such village is the home of the Pachacutec family, a dwelling of adobe, thatching, and occasional patches of tile. Today, Grandfather Pachacutec sits quietly near the doorway, chewing the much-relished coca leaves. The approach of a village boy leading a llama, the favorite beast of burden in the Andes, evokes only a listless response. In the fields, other members of the Pachacutec family have long been busily at work. Planting is underway. The dry earth of the plateau is first turned up with primitive foot flowers. In the wake of the foot flowers, father guides his team of oxen, making the furrows in which seeds are planted. Plodding along laboriously and slow, the oxen draw the ancient wooden plow made from a tree fork. In the furrow, Alta, a daughter, scatters fertilizer, and Maldo, her brother, completes the planting. Plowed, fertilized, and planted, the Pachacutec fields will yield corn and potatoes grown here through many centuries. The arrival of a water carrier in the field brings a welcome pause. Poured from a native earthenware vessel into a cup, likewise a product of local handicraft, the cool water offers needed refreshment after the long morning of work in the fields. And now, with the crude tools temporarily laid aside, the family prepare for their midday meal. A meal eaten in the open, with the earth itself serving as a table. From a large earthenware pot, 
Mother serves out bowls of vegetable stew, in which the ever-present potatoes are the chief ingredient. Following customary practice, Apuri, her son, eats the mixture without benefit of fork or spoon. Each one drinks the nourishing liquid directly from his dish. In their eating habits, as in their agricultural methods, the family reflect the ways of a people who've long lived close to the soil. Meanwhile, in a pasture not far away, the wife of Apuri tends a flock of llamas. Nor is her attention directed to the animals alone. On a small hand loom of traditional pattern, she weaves a strip of belting, incorporating a conventional Indian design with vari-colored yarns. Thus, in field and pasture, the Pachakutek family reveal a traditional division of labor. Likewise, those who remain in the village pursue their respective specialized tasks. Today, as in centuries past, the women of the Andes villages prepare the yarn for homespun clothing. The techniques of a machine age are still unknown. Just as Apuri's wife plies her hand loom in the field, other women of the village sit all day at larger looms. With eyes intent on the work at hand, they fashion the yarn from the spindles into fabrics. Clothing must be strong and warm in the cold climate of the high Andes. Like all members of the village community, the butcher has his special work. But meat is a small part of the diet of a people who depend chiefly on potatoes and corn. Baker, butcher, weaver, spinner and grinder of corn all make their contributions to the closely knit village life which centers largely around the marketplace. And here, as in field and home, food is the major concern. Potatoes, some newly harvested, and others preserved by freezing, are ever present. In the produce of the fields, in colorful native headgear, and in the market itself, the ancient ways continue to find expression. Towards evening, Apuri's wife leads her unhurried flock back across the tranquil plateau to the village. From the village in the morning, to the village at night. Such is the rhythm of routine for those of the community who till the soil or tend the flocks of llamas. Another day will bring another repetition of the old familiar round followed in the village through the years. The plows put aside today will be taken up once more on tomorrow's return to the fields. The llamas will await another day of grazing in pastures centuries old. For a season, most of the men of the village depart to work in mines or on plantations. They leave the women to climb the rugged slopes to work in the fields. It is the women who bring the village crops to maturity among the high Andean mountains. They are aided in this work by native llamas and by sturdy, plodding burrows, reminiscent of the Spanish conquest centuries ago. At harvest time, across the bridge that leads to the outside world, Men of the village begin returning home from their work in the white man's mines and plantations. In this return to their ancestral mountain homes, they answer the age-old call of the clan. Reunion with their families, sharing together the harvest from the soil. From strange places of the outside world, gifts are brought back for the women folk, and experiences of past months recounted. The celebration includes a pilgrimage to Cusco, where natives from the surrounding mountains come for marketing and for friendly reunion near the imposing cathedral, whose tower has sent out its call through the centuries, since the white man brought a new religion to the land of the children of the sun. In Cusco's marketplace, the visitors gather to buy, to sell, to butter. And here, elders from the villages meet to exchange local gossip and to chew the popular coca leaves. In their faces is the story of a people who have survived, a people with a heritage of an ancient Indian culture whose glories are dimly echoed in many a crumbling ruin set starkly against the eternal Andes.